better? Oh, yeah. It's interesting. When he whispers back to us, like shouting at us. Now, you can throw that first slide up, Chris. You know, a couple, last week, I guess it was actually two weeks ago, wasn't it, now, that we looked at the um, clever notes and artwork of the junior church. Now, that was something that Shar had come up with, the idea to help the kids to, you know, push them along to think about the message. Now, this week, this is from the senior church. And what we're looking at, if I can understand how this contraption works, before Jacob met God face to face, he was a scoundrel in his heart. Lying, cheating, deceiving, serving Satan from the start. Isn't that just like us? Before surrendering to Christ our life, we too followed the ways of the evil one who always causes strife. Next slide. However, once we have our Bethel experience, we begin to see things from above. We should keep our minds stayed upon him, and then we be filled with love. So daily, let us seek him and worship before his throne, showing the world around us that we are God's very own. Isn't that a good conclusion? And the senior that does did this is one that will oftentimes do this very thing for each of the speakers. And then she will give it to them a week or two weeks afterwards uh, in a poetic form. Isn't it? I think this is an awesome uh, summary of that portion of scripture that we looked at that particular Sunday. Thank you, Ruth. Have a really special. Heavenly Father, we want to give you praise and thanksgiving for your love. Thank you for watching over us and truly caring for us, asking that we would give our attention to you first and foremost. Lord, we live in a world of chaos, and it's increasing, and then, uh, it seems to be in escalating in a just an incredible way. And we can get our focus upon that instead of upon your greatness, your absoluteness, your sovereignty. Help us, Lord, this morning to allow your Holy Spirit to touch our own hearts and lives through the truths of Scripture that we could walk out uh, just sensing your steadfast love and concern for each and every so single one of us. I thank you, Father, for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, please take your Bibles and turn with me to Genesis uh, chapter 37, we read that for our scripture reading, but I just want to highlight this as we go through, because if we just gloss over it, I think we'll lose some of that dynamics that uh, the Lord has here in, God's, in his word. This is concerning Jacob, and as you read through these verses, you will see that, man, this is about Jacob. Jacob's about himself. And I, I look at this and I see the arrogancy and the pride of Jacob. Um, that, let's follow this through. First of all, I said Jacob. I mean Joseph. Please forgive me. And Joseph, down in the latter part of verse 2, Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. That doesn't always build too good of a relationship with family, as Mike said. And we, and oftentimes the one that's bringing that bad report, we just kind of get a little bit, a little bit proud, a little bit puffed up, um, thinking we're better than the others. So that's one of the scenarios that we find here that Joseph had walked through. 
And then we find that Israel loved Joseph more than any, any of his other sons. <laughs> there we go. Can you see it happening? Okay, he's just kind of rising to the occasion of pride and, oh, dad loves me best. I remember, <laughs> this is going to date me. How many of you remember the Smother Brothers? What was the one brother always saying about the other brother? All right, one person said it so I can understand it. <laughs> Mom loves me best. You know, my hearing's starting to get in crazy stuff for me. So when I hear different ones, it gets out of key. Mom always loved you best. Mm hmm. All right. And then we find that he also had a robe, robe of many colors. And, of course, this uh, just has increased that whole favoritism picture that uh, causes strife within the household and the, and the family. And then, down in verse 5 on through verse 8, we find that he had a dream. And the dream was that the sheaves are out in the field, which is the way they used to harvest grain, not as we do today. And... All their sheaves were brought together. His sheep stood up, and all the other sheaves bowed down to it. You can see that one over like a lead balloon. <laughs> it just was imp uh, repulsive to his family. And then the later dream was that the, the sun, the moon, and the stars bowed down before him. Now, these dreams... I can just see taking place that prompted Joseph to become a little bit more arrogant, more prideful. Uh, it, it was just a, a, a bad scene taking place. Now, I want you to go with me over to Genesis chapter 50. And you can jot these passages down. I encourage you to jot these down. Look them up this afternoon and give attention to what the framework. Genesis chapter 50, take a look at verses 15 through 21. But for the sake of time, we're going to jump in at verse 19. Now, this is after his father and his brothers and their families all came into Egypt. This is at the very end um, of that whole scenario. Now, in verse 19, it says, But Joseph said to them, this would be after um, even his uh, dad's funeral, he says, Do not fear, speaking to his brothers, for am I in the place of God? Remember, they were, they were afraid in the context. That, all right, now that dad's gone, Joseph's going to let loose on us. He's going to give us big trouble. And then in the other places, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. So what he's saying in verse 19, uh, I'm not God. Don't bow down to me. That's a humbling element for Joseph. And then also, repeating or responding to his family, you meant it for evil, all those things that you've done to me. But God meant it for good. How did this change come about? We see Joseph, the arrogant, prideful rascal that he was. And you know it's kind of comforting to know that? You go through Hebrews 11, and it's comforting to me that the predominant ones that are stated there in Hebrews 11, in that faith chapter, were sinners and displayed themselves openly as sinners. They're weak, just like you and I. So I find that comforting, that I have that hope that maybe God in his grace could reach out to me and bring me into his presence in an assured way. But why how did this change take place? That rascal of a Joseph to the point where 
he is saying, I'm not God. You meant all this trouble for evil, but my God meant it for good. I want to share a, a, a thought that I saw in my mom when I was growing up as a youngster. My mom was very sharp tongued, very bitter, very angry, very negative. That's my home environment that I grew up in. And you can imagine, it wasn't a fun environment. I come home from school not being assured that my mom and dad were going to be there together. I was always concerned that one or the other would have split off. It was a scary time. After my dad passed away, my mom moved into Batavia and started attending a church in Batavia. And Diane and I could see something taking place in my mom. That sharpness started to soften. That negativism um, actually was building towards a positive statement. <laughs> it was amazing. She never said anything particular that had taken place in her life. But we could see this change. We were glad, but we were a little on the confused side. And one time she invited Diane and I to come to her baptism. Here she is, she's in her 70s, mind you, okay? <laughs> And there, like here, they asked the baptismal candidate to share their testimony. And she shared that she always thought she was a Christian because she went to church. Are you there? Are you in that category where you think you're a Christian because you come to church? I'm going to ask you and encourage you to rethink that. She went on to share that she sat underneath a particular pastor who prompted her to realize that she needed a personal relationship with God the Father. And that personal relationship with God the Father was available to her through Jesus Christ, whom God the Father sent to come to this earth, to go to the cross, to pay for her sins. <laughs> Diane and I broke down in tears that evening. We understood the foundation of this change. It wasn't just that she was pulling on her own bootstraps and making herself a quote-unquote better person. She came face-to-face and as Ruthie shared, a Bethel experience of that relationship that she had with the Lord God Almighty through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus saith, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Don't get caught in the trap of thinking that you can do it by your own effort. Or you can do it by coming to church. It's an intimate, personal decision, a choice on your behalf to begin living for him, to become a disciple. That's what we saw and we heard take place in mom's life. It was a relationship through God, to God, through Jesus Christ. That was just dynamic for us. Just dynamic, and it still is. I'm thankful 
that she had a heart that was tender and open to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Now, Joseph, he, God sent him to school. He didn't know he had schools then. Well, he did. They did. And some of you, and probably actually most of you, are in the same school just like I am. You know the school that I'm talking about? The school of hard knocks. That's real school, my friends. Pardon? Tough classes. <laughs> Tough classes, yeah. Yeah. The assignments are sometimes very, very difficult. Now, I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles and go over to Genesis 37. And we're going to start taking a look at this. Looking at verses 18 through 36. So I'm going to ask you to jot those verses down and look at them in your own time at home. 18 through 36. I want us to take a particular look at verse 39. Um, thir yeah, 37 verses 18 through 36. We're going to skip down through this. The school of hard knocks. Verse 18. They saw him from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. That's a big school of hard knocks. Someone was planning to kill me, and I knew about it, and I sensed that. Um, yep, I would do a lot of thinking. And this is what I'm sure Joseph did. And then later on, we find down in verse 22, and Reuben said to them, Oh, shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand upon him. And then down in 24, and then they took him and they threw him into the pit. The pit was empty and there was no water in it. Well, I'm sure that uh, Joseph responded, though, Phew, they're not killing me, but <laughs> that's a long ways up there. I can't even reach up and touch bottom. Have you been to that point? At some point in your life, you go through struggles, trials, battles, and you feel as if you can reach up and still not touch bottom. We've been there, most of us, anyways. And this is where Joseph was at. So his life was spared. And then his brothers came down to a point. They were eating. They saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming down through. And they said, wow. What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him. And they sold him for 20 shekels of silver. Slavery. A person being sold like a piece of property or an animal. Um, that's a toughie. That is a toughie. Still alive, but it had to be a degrading time for Joseph. And then they followed along, and they came down in verse 36. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. Sold again. And then we find over in 39, we find that um, he had some more trouble. Looking at verse 11, he was, Joseph at this point was entrusted by Potiphar with the household, and he had been in the house. And we find that um, in Joseph, that he was a handsome in form and appearance. 
And so many, some of you are blessed with that. The rest of us are not. But sometimes that can be a troublesome thing. If we become prideful of how handsome we are or how attractive we are, it can cause a lot of trouble in our lives. So if you feel that that is the case for you, be careful. Be very careful. He was handsome in form and appearance, and after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Why with me? But he refused, and he said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, for he has kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How can I do this great wickedness and, the sin, and sin against God? And she spoke to Joseph day after day, and he would not listen to her or to lie with her or to be with her. But one day when he went into the house to do his work, and there was no other men in the house there, she caught him by the garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house and as soon as he could. And then she took that garment to the master, told him the story, a story. The Hebrew servant whom you brought among us came in to be laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and I cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. Falsely accused of attempted rape. School of hard knocks. And then we find in verse 19, the master heard these words that his wife spoke, and he said, this is, she said, this is the way your servants treated me. And his anger was kindled against Joseph. So things are multiplying in the school of hard knocks. So then the master took him and then put him into prison. Over in chapter 40, while he was in prison, there were a couple of prisoners that were thrown in by the uh, governorship of that area, and they had a dream. And they were telling this dream to Joseph, and Joseph interpreted it. And one dream was that the one man was going to, he was going to be decapitated. The other one was going to be stored back to service. And the dreams and the interpretation that Joseph gave worked out. That was proof that what Joseph had said was true. And the agreement was, okay, you go back into the palace, you share with them that I'm here, that maybe you can help get me out. <laughs> In verse 23 of chapter 40, Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. You know, there's nothing more disappointing than an unfulfilled agreement from someone. Someone promises you something, and then it doesn't follow through. They get sidetracked. You know, it's easy to say things. Before you make a statement, think about it. Are you going to make a statement to kind of ease the current events and the situation? Or is it a promise that you're going to walk through and fulfill, even at your own inconvenience? So these were the schools of hard knocks that Joseph walked through. Now, how do you and I respond to the school of hard knocks? Sometimes the school of hard knocks are the consequences of our own poor choices. Did you hear that? Sometimes the school of hard knocks are the consequences of our poor choices. We have no one else to blame what we're facing than ourselves. Those scenarios come down to us shortly after the event, or sometimes they're long-term, long-term, long-term. And then there are situations that 
there are consequences below, beyond our control. And we have different choices in that. We can be teachable or we can be angry. We can be focused on upon God or we can be focused upon ourselves. We can trust God or sometimes we can go ahead and try to work it out on our own effort. And that takes us absolutely no place except for a dead end street. I want you to take your Bibles and go with me back to Deuteronomy chapter 5. There's some neat passages here in Scripture that talk about our relationship with God and some of the promises that God has given to us. Deuteronomy chapter 5. Take a look at verses 28 through 33. And we're not going to take and walk through all the way of this, but I want us to take a focus upon the idea that God has a special concern for us. 28, and the Lord heard your words when you spoke to me, and the Lord said to me, I've heard the words of this people which they have spoken to you. They are right in all their ways and have spoken Oh, that they had such a heart as this always to fear me and to keep all my commandments that it may go well with them and with their descendants forever. Chapter 6. Now, this is the commandment, the statutes, the rules that the Lord our God has commanded me to teach you that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's sons, and by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, that your days, days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, be careful to do them, that it may go well with you. Verse 18. And you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may go well with you. And then over in verse 24. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for his good always, that he might preserve us alive as we are this day. And it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to do all his commandments before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. Those passages reflect the thoughts of Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. That sounds real good, doesn't it? And then Hebrews eleven six. 6. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Boy, that sounds good. But the problem is, in our affluent American background, we look at those promises and those hopes through the wrong lens. Just talking with Sue, she needs to go in and have um, cataract operation. And they tell me that's improved a great deal. I remember my mom's cataract operation. They sandbagged her head so it could not move for a number of days. <laughs> now you go in and you go home. Hopefully that will take place comfortably for you. New lens, you can see again. Wow. Looking forward to that sometime myself. But we look at it through the wrong lens of our comfort, and our convenient, our prosperity in our lives. We're looking at it selfishly. Then it may be well with you. And God's perspective, he's looking at it from his point of view. 
a reaching and a deepening of a relationship with him. Because he knows he's our life. He's our fulfillment. We are made in his image, and he is working, endeavoring to build us and draw us and closer into that likeness. Because he knows that's what's the best for us. And you and I are down here, we're squirming and fighting and we're, we're just carrying on. We don't like it because the school of hard knocks are not easy. But they're real and God means it for good. The very best for each and every one of us. You know, I've enjoyed going through Joseph. And I see, as I walk through the experience of Joseph, I've seen that Joseph responded in understanding that the Lord God was and is the awesome, almighty God. There's a phrase over in Psalms 101, so turn there with me, please. Psalms 101. The Psalms and the Proverbs are so rich, folks. I hope you take time to spend time in those scriptures. Psalms 101, take and look at verse 6. I will look with favor on the faithful in the land that they may dwell with me. He who walks in the way that is blameless shall minister to me. We had some hard news the other night, just as Di and I were, we've been camping up at Golden Hill, and um, internet's not too good. Every once in a while it works, and at times it does and doesn't. And we've been praying for Christina. Got a text from my daughter saying that um, she's been going downhill. That was earlier in the day, later. We got a text from my daughter saying that Christina has gone home to glory to meet her heavenly father. You know, I was relieved and deeply burdened. I know the family is agonizing through this. She put up a huge battle to try to fight this cancer. I go through and find comfort knowing that <laughs> actually she's more alive than I am. But I know mom, dad, brothers, sisters are going to agonize over the loss of that loved one. A lot of friends, family, grandparents are going to agonize over the loss of that loved one. But we should not deny the fact she is actually better off than you and I. And I want to, I'm going to skip a bit here. Again. We have communion, and I don't want to slight Brian's time on that. But if you will go ahead and take a look at a couple things, and reading through about Joseph, you will find that Joseph came to that point where he was very God-focused. And he related that to his family. Well, I think that's an awesome thing. And then the next thing that is important to me as I read through this, and particularly in chapter 43 and then in 45, Joseph um, speaks in a humble way. Now, I've been sharing with a various young people, a book titled The Sacred Search by Gary Thomas. And I would recommend that any individual, fellow or gal, high school on up, single, read this book to prepare your hearts and your mind for a godly approach for a godly marriage. And there's one element that 
Gary speaks of, who, Gary Thomas, who speaks of this, he talks about being humble. And you know, we sometimes, we approach marriage in a prideful way or a selfish way. Um, we're getting married so I can have my pleasures and my wants and, you know, it's, it's about us. And that's a wrong direction to take in respects to marriage. Listen to some of these things that Gary Thomas shares. A quick definition, humility, and that's what Joseph came to. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking less about yourself. Do you, do you see the distinction there? It's not a matter of thinking less of yourself. Why not? Because you and I are made in the image of God. But humility, humbleness, is thinking less and less about ourselves and more about others. Now I get into a conversation when I'm with anyone, and then I hear, I, 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 and I start to say, oh, this is getting worn out. This is a tough conversation. It's all about the individual rather than about the Lord God Almighty. A humble person is someone who has experienced and is experiencing conviction of sin. They are aware that they fall short every day and that they have much to work on. And biblical grace is the only place that they put their hope. Another phrase that Gary Thomas speaks about humility is here. Humility matters more than money, more than appearance. It is the character foundation for growth and godliness. Humility is putting God first, not anything. Humility is a cornerstone of character and the foundation of a growing intimate relationship. That's true horizontally in this book. We're talking about a potential marriage, husband and wife. I don't believe that it's possible for a highly arrogant person to be intimately connected with someone. Arrogant people use people they don't love them. And besides, the Bible says, no less than three times, God opposes the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. A humble person lives with biblical conviction of our overall sin nature as well as our particular sins. A humble person lives out of the gospel that we are helpless to save or even change ourselves apart from the work of Christ and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. A humble person is open to receiving appropriate correction and eager to take action when faults are pointed out. A humble person lives authentically is concerned with growing in righteousness rather than merely appearing righteous. And a humble person aspires to excel in being a servant. A humble person considers the fact that she may be wrong. Boy, that's important in marriage. I remember some of the conflicts that Di and I had in our early parts of our marriage, and they, every once in a while they'll throw its ugly head right up of there again. I'm right, you're wrong. <laughs> Attitude. That was th we both did that, okay? All right, we, we both did that. <laughs> the more concerned with walking in light and truth and in being right. A humble person prays and studies, confesses, and asks people to hold them accountable as he knows he is a work in progress. Isn't that where you and I are at? We are a work in progress. 
Arrogance destroys fruitfulness in the service of God. And in our flesh, you know, let's admit it, you and I are impressed by the flesh. He's handsome, he's beautiful, he speaks well, he's got man, good mannerisms. You know, boy, that, that, is, that influences you and I. But it, God just is up there shaking his head. And he's saying, big deal. Get your heart right with me. And that's what's important. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the life of Joseph. It, oh, for me, it was a, just an awesome, awesome study. And I'm so thankful, Father, that your word addresses real issues. But we don't gain anything from that till we actually sit down and open scripture. And I pray, Lord, that you'll find more and more folks in this congregation opening up your word, not just on Sundays, but on Monday. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Lord, you love us. You care for us in a genuine way. And we are thankful, Father, for that. I thank you for Joseph's example. He was an overcomer. Kind of a lousy start. Prideful, arrogant Joseph. <laughs> and we see that with Jacob, Lord. Well, it didn't start well. It was an overcomer. Ended well. Lord, may we be that. May we end well. In Jesus' name, amen.